In Thailand, they sometimes compare practicing meditation to flying a kite. It takes a fair amount of effort to get the kite up into the air until it finally catches the wind. And then it doesn't take much effort anymore. The energy of the practice at that point keeps feeding itself. Now in Thai, the, the phrase catching the wind is actually a play on words, because the word for wind and the word for breath are the same word, lom. So when you practice, when you finally get to the breath and it feels easiest to stay with the breath, that's when you've caught the wind. And the practice picks up its own momentum. The tricky part, of course, is getting the kite up into the air, getting to the part where the energy you put into the practice gets less and less, and the practice itself produces the energy you need. And you'll find this at various stages in the practice. It doesn't simply happen once and for all that you catch the wind and then have no more problems. The kites sometimes, of course, fall down and you have to get them back up in the air again. And so it's good to know some ways of generating energy. So that you have the ability to get things up in the air, to catch the wind again. And the Buddha discusses persistence. It's one of the five strengths. It builds on conviction. That's one of the mental ways of giving rise to more energy. When he discusses it in the context of the seven factors for awakening, it builds on mindfulness, keeping something in mind. And so what are the ways of giving rise to conviction that are going to energize you and what are the things you have to keep in mind that are going to give rise to more energy? In the seven factors of awakening, the Buddha talks about qualities that act as a foothold for energy or the potential for energy, but then he doesn't explain what they are. This is where you have to look around in yourself, and this is where you have to learn from others. That's the part you have to keep in mind. And essentially it comes down to two sorts of sources, sources within the mind and sources within the body. In terms of the body, you may want to look at the way you're breathing, because there are some very peaceful and calm ways of breathing that actually deplete the energy in your body. So if you find that your energy level is low, what can you do to change the way you breathe? Try to notice which parts of the body seem to be overworked, the ones that are doing all the work in the breathing and don't seem to be getting any, any refreshment from the breath. Consciously relax those parts and say, if the body is going to breathe in, other parts will have to take over. But those are the parts that are going to stay relaxed regardless. And you'll find that other parts of the body will pitch in. And watch that for a while. And see if the way they're breathing actually does improve the energy in the body. Sometimes you have to remind yourself that the, the body is, as you experience it, is all breath. Whatever sensation comes up, think of it an aspect of breath energy. And then ask yourself, is that healthy breath energy or not? If it were healthy, what would it feel like? Sometimes you hold in mind the perception that it's solid, and you put up with all kinds of stuff with a solidity that you wouldn't put up with if you thought this was breath. Then conversely, there are times when you feel a need for something really solid and grounding to get your energy going. So you have to play with your perceptions here to see what perception of what's going on in the body can actually be helpful.
the parts of the body that you may be suppressing that could actually be a source of energy. And John Lee talks of the breath that goes up the spine and the breath that goes up the, the center line in the front of the torso. Do you have any room for that kind of breath energy in the way you breathe, or do you squash it? Or when you're feeling tired, which parts of the body are you focusing on as feeling tired? Which parts are actually okay? Switch your perception around to the parts that are okay. See what that does. In other words, realize that there are pockets of energy in the body, and not just in the body, all around you. And John Lee talks about what he calls the elements that surround the body. They actually give nourishment to it. Sometimes these elements can come into the different chakras, the different resting points of the breath, as John Lee calls them. Think of an energy outside the body coming in and nourishing the, the point in the middle of the chest, nourishing the point in the middle of your head, any point that seems to need extra energy. Tap into the energies around you. There are some good ones. Learn how to recognize the good ones. They basically feel refreshing as soon as you allow them in. So there are potentials there you might not have thought of. And it's good to remember that there are those possibilities there. As for energy that comes from the mind, the Buddha talks about gladdening the mind. Thinking about topics that give rise to a sense of inspiration. It can be the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, your own generosity, your own virtue. Sometimes putting the breath aside for the time being and thinking about these things is very helpful. Thinking about the Sangha, for instance, thinking about all the Ajans and the success they had in the practice. Remember, they were human beings, you're a human being. They can do it, you can do it. This is the message they always give. One of the purposes of this is to dig out any attitudes you may be holding that are actually harmful, that actually do sap your energy. Like the attitude, well, I probably won't be able to get anywhere in this lifetime. I'll just kind of muddle around a little bit and hope that things will go better next time around. Ask yourself if part of your mind is holding on to that. Now, why would it hold on to that? Well, it doesn't want to put out too much effort. You don't want to set the bar too high. And in so doing, you sort of beat yourself down with the bar. If you're more open to the possibility that, yes, you could attain one of the noble attainments in this lifetime, does that energize you? Does it scare you? Look into that. Other contemplations, of course, that give rise to a sense of energy can be the contemplation of death. Realizing that you don't know when it's going to come or how it's going to come. All these prophecies have been floating around about the year 2012. the end of the world or whatever. You may not even live to see the end of the world. Something might happen before then. This is not meant to get you depressed. It's meant to motivate you to realize okay, there are important things that need to be done in the mind. If aging, illness, and death come, or when they come, what qualities of mind are you going to need? You see some people as they approach death and they just get totally thrown off balance. They can't even allow themselves to think about the future. 
and if they had a bad past, that is something they don't want to think about either. This is, I think, a lot of reason why there's a lot of dementia that goes on as death approaches. You don't know where to focus your mind. Well, if you had a meditation practice, you know you focus right here at the breath, trying to maintain this awareness of the present moment so it doesn't go flailing around. You're going to need mindfulness. You're going to need alertness. You're going to need as much concentration and discernment as you can muster. And when are you going to develop that if you don't develop it now? Because right now is a really good opportunity. You're sitting here meditating. It's quiet. One of the contemplations that the Buddha has the monks make. In fact, it's one that even a John, <coughs> excuse me, King Ashoka recommended. It's in one of his edicts, thinking about future dangers. Aging, illness, and death can come. Social unrest can come. A split in the Sangha can come. If you tell yourself, well, I'll wait until my next lifetime, he warns that the, the Dharma and the Vinaya are going to deteriorate over time. The opportunities don't get better. So you make use of the opportunity you have now. And so in this case, you're motivating yourself with a little bit of fear, the wise kind of fear, the fear that's related to heedfulness. So it's up to you to decide what you need to think about to motivate yourself to practice. Sometimes it's the positive side of the encouragement. You hold out a carrot. Sometimes you have the stick to remind yourself that if you don't work now, it's not going to get easier. Now they've done studies of people who are really expert in physical skills, and they've discovered they have this ability to motivate themselves using both types of motivation, a strong sense of the harm that can be done if you don't master this skill, and a strong sense of the positive things that can come when you do. And so you have to learn how to deal with your own mind. And when one method of motivation isn't working, well, remember you've got other possibilities, other choices, other tools in your kit. So what it comes down to is that you try to find sources of energy in the body and sources of energy in the way you think. That you can then channel into your mindfulness, alertness, and concentration. It gives more ardency to the practice so the kite can get up in the air. Ideally, when your energy turns into a right effort, one of the results is rapture, refreshment, a sense of well-being that then becomes food for a further concentration. This is when the, the kite finally catches the wind. You're focused on the breath in the way that gives rise to a sense of fullness, and then you feed off that so that you can stay with it more consistently a greater sense of solidity, stability. So remember, right effort is not just a matter of brute force. It requires your ingenuity and your intelligence, your ability to find sources of energy that are there, that you've overlooked or that you've been squashing. Look at the way you think. Look at the way you breathe. Look at the way you hold your body. See if there's anything you can change. Any ways of thinking that are keeping you down, learn to question them. Any ways of breathing that are stifling your energy, just drop them. Ask yourself, 
which parts of the body are getting starved of energy, and where is some energy in another part of the body that can help feed them. If it can't be found in the body, remind yourself there is energy around the body. Tap into that. And so this is the use of mindfulness. Remember that you've got these potential sources. Don't forget them. And then the skill learns in <coughs> skill, excuse me, the skill lies in learning how to put them to use. So the kite gets up into the wind and the energy can feed on itself. keep the practice going. So it becomes steadier and more reliable. And the quality of energy or persistence does become what they call a dominant factor in the mind. <clears throat> 